There's something wrong with you. And also with you. This is the first episode of a podcast we're calling Light Conversations. One of the things that uh, Pastor Kyle and I have enjoyed in working together is having theological conversations almost every day while we're in the office together. These are conversations that help us to grapple with big issues or small, help us to figure out how to express things, and especially how to apply what God says in His Word to our daily lives, but also hopefully the members of our congregation. And, and we thought it would be really fun for us to share these conversations with you. Uh, they're, they're going to be light in the sense that they're informal. Uh, we haven't written a script. We, ha we are not you know, spending hours in preparation for this. Um, maybe, I guess, hours in, in the classroom uh, years ago, for me at least. But, but in other words, we want it to be something that's normal so that we can begin to talk this way at home and we can talk about Christ in our lives and what that means and, and how do we worship and how do we take God's word with us each day to work or school or whatever. So that's kind of the purpose of it. We're also calling it Light Conversations because our church name is Light of the Hills and we want that to remind us that we are called to be, well, Jesus is the light of the world and Jesus calls his disciples uh, the light of the world and he says, don't, you know, don't hide that bring it out. And so that's kind of the purpose for these conversations. And uh, we're hoping that as we do these, you'll find them helpful, encouraging, and occasionally even maybe insightful. Well, now, say enlightening. Uh, oh, enlightening. I like that. That's good. Yep. So um, that's what we'll be doing. Um, my name is Alan Summer. If you don't know me, I'm uh, not a member of our church. I'm uh, one of the pastors here at Lighted Hills. I've been here the longest. One of the reasons they call me the senior pastor, I guess, and I'll let him introduce himself. I'm Kyle Weeks. I'm the associate pastor here at Light of the Hills. Yep, and so we've been, uh, we've been really enjoying working together. And uh, so today, for our first episode, um, we want you to be patient because we under, we're messing with cameras and lighting, and we know it's probably not the best, and oh, well, we'll, we'll keep chipping away at that. But far more important is what we're talking about. So today... Uh, this being the week after the Super Bowl, we want to talk about the GOAT, the greatest of all time. I was disappointed with the game. It wasn't close, it wasn't exciting, and I really didn't want Brady to get another ring on his finger. And now he's got, I think he's got seven. Yeah, seven. That's, it's, that's disgusting. It's a, a very biblical number, too, so it was insult, added insult to injury there. Well, maybe it's the number of completeness, and now he's done. <laughs> yeah. What is he? How old is he? 69? <laughs> I think he's, he's 43. 43, yeah. yeah. To me, that seems really young. But, yeah. Uh, yeah, so he's he's pretty much acknowledged now as the greatest yeah. of all time, and it's kind of hard to deny that after him leaving his team where he'd been for all these years in his first year with another team that I think they finished last in their division last year. Tampa Bay? I think so. Anyways, I know they weren't very good. Yeah, but before now, we could we could put it off on Belichick, you know, give credit to, to Belichick to and to yeah. the Patriots organization. And as a Packers fan, I am especially <laughs> um, just, uh, I'm lamenting all of this because there was always a conversation. If you had Aaron Rodgers facing off against Tom Brady, who would be the GOAT? And we had our chance. But I will say in that game, yeah. Brady threw three interceptions. That's he did true. not look good. Rodgers outplayed Brady. Right yeah, the Tampa Bay back. defense outplayed but, the Green Bay offense. Yeah. Well, anyways, we could get lost in talking about that for a long time. <laughs> um, but it, this got us thinking then about our topic for today. And our topic for today is love your neighbor. And that's not always easy to do. But there's a context to that. We'll, we'll give some of the context now. And then at the end, I think... To me, I think for both of us, our favorite part of that context we'll save till the end. But Jesus was asked a, a question. Someone came to him and said, okay, Jesus, what is the goat of all the commandments? What, what, is the, what is the greatest commandment? 
And he gave a very simple answer, didn't he? He said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. Um, and I think it, with all your mind is included in one of the translations uh, or one of the Gospels as well. And, and so he was actually asked this question, what's the most important commandment? And clearly, and of course, Jesus is right. He gets to be right. Uh, it is to love the Lord your God. So love God with all you are, uh, with all that you have. Um, your heart, your soul, your strength, and your mind. But, but what's interesting is that Jesus answers, and, and he, he gives two commandments. And so he adds to that, right? He, he says, well, another is like it. He says, love your neighbor as yourself. And that is harder. At, at least it feels harder. Because honestly, we probably don't love God like we should, and we're probably nowhere near loving God with all our heart, soul, strength, and mind. I know that's certainly true for me. Um, but, but at least it feels easier because I can look at God. I can say, look what he's done for me. Look what Jesus did for me. He loves me. He forgives me. He's always there. But my neighbor, yeah, he hasn't done anything like that. My neighbor's kind of a jerk. And uh, I, have, I have struggles with that. So we were writing some notes down and talking about this. Um, uh, that it's not optional to love God. These are, these are not suggestions, right? Uh, I have a great cartoon in one of the classes I teach, and it's a husband and wife, and they're, they're sitting at, uh, or they're standing before the altar. It's, it's their wedding day. And uh, uh, one of the, I can't remember if it's the bride or the groom, but one of them says, wedding vows? How about we just call them wedding suggestions? <laughs> and and we, we kind of like that in our, in our relationship with God and with our neighbor, that well, how about, how about you just suggest that I love God most of the time? Because I don't really enjoy doing that all of the time. And how about I just love the neighbors that I like? How about that? You know, that's not what Jesus says, is it? Love the Lord your God. It's an imperative. It's a command. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind. And you will love your neighbors yourself, Jesus adds to that. And that's hard right now, isn't it? It's very difficult, especially in this society and just in general, we're much better at seeing the sin in other people, too, right, than we are in seeing the sin in ourselves. And we are very, very good at picking out uh, the sin and the mistakes uh, that other people make. Um, and it's kind of like I've said before with the youth. We look at ourselves, and it's like you go into the department store, and they've got the mirrors that take 10 pounds off. And you think, ooh, I look, I look good in these clothes. Wow, I need to buy these, right? And then... Uh, you go into the, when we look at other people, it's like you go into the the circus and you've got the house of mirrors, right? And they distort you and, you know, you look crazy, you look deranged like a monster there. And that's how we see everybody else. Yeah. Um, and so then to go into, to love those people where we're blind to our own mistakes and it seems like there's a spotlight in our minds on theirs um, is really, really difficult when we're dealing with real people out there and, uh, but you're, you can't love anybody without having someone to love that's right yeah that's that's a really great way to say that because look at what's happened the last year i mean do we love the neighbor who is not a republican or not a democrat you know depending on where you, where you live in the country what county you're in and we live in a pretty conservative county i think probably most of the, or many of the voters here are republican um, you live in, say, the Bay Area, you have many of the report, uh, voters there are, are Democrats. And, and in our culture, we have, we have brought such a divide that it's easy for us to hate people who don't have the same political view we have. It's easy to think they're incredibly stupid, incredibly narrow-minded, or uh, incredibly permissive, or whatever, whatever discouraging epithet we want to use. Uh, we, we can look at them and say, man, they're they stink as a person, or you know, my, my brother-in-law is just an idiot, or that person on TV is just stupid. Yeah. And, and very quickly, we turn away from loving neighbor, and, and we say, that's not my neighbor. Yeah. That person is not my neighbor because they're a jerk. And uh, boy, we've seen that so much this year in, in so many ways. And, and the whole COVID-19 thing is a huge part of that, where... There can be people who are rational, reasonable people. Now, we all do this. We, we can go to our favorite website, find our favorite study, uh, the person whose views align with our own, and say, that doctor says 
this is effective or it's not effective. That doctor says this is dangerous or it's not dangerous. And we surround ourselves with the opinions of those who agree with us online, and then we're armed and ready for the next discussion we might have with someone um, in our neighborhood, our family, or yes, even in our church. And that's damaging to the church, and that really needs to stop because we we will look at each other, and when, when we look at each other, if, if uh, for example, a great illustration of this is the communion rail in a church. Communion rails have always been built either round or semicircle or something like that, almost always, not always, but much of the time. And, and the reason for that is that when, when I look at you and I'm kneeling at the communion rail, I'm looking through the body and blood of Christ. And, and so I see you as someone for whom Christ died, and I see you... Uh, as part of the same body, we are one body because we partake of one loaf. And that's 1 Corinthians 10, 16, or 17, or 15, somewhere in there. Um, and, and so that, that is how we are to look at each other. That God created us, first of all, that we are made in the image of God. And so uh, if I'm made in the image of God and you're made in the image of God, you know, definitely that, that affects how I look at you. And if you are one for whom Christ died, that should affect how I look at you. But instead, in our day and age, we, we look at, at web pages and social media posts, and we become angry with each other. It's hard to love our neighbor. Yeah. And that's tragic. No, it is. And I think part of the reason we do that is just because if we're being honest with ourselves, it is easier to demonize and vilify and dehumanize other people yeah. Rather than say, okay, maybe they're making an argument in good faith here. Yes. That in a, they're, um, because it's, then we can write them off. Yes. If they're, if they're the villain, we can write them off. Um, but it's a lot harder to say maybe somebody we disagree with um, is actually intelligent and virtuous and well-intentioned, and we just happen to disagree. Yeah. Um, and they and, might be wrong, but that doesn't yeah. give me the excuse to, to vilify them. Yeah. To, to hate them. And, and that's the thing, is that if you're vilifying someone else um, or de dehumanizing them or, or whatever it is, right, you can't love that person. Mm -hmm. And Those I don't need don't to. go together. I just don't need to. Yeah. Yeah, and that's, that's the amazing thing. And, and you're know, pulling this back to Jesus during his gospel uh, ministry. I guess all his ministry is gospel. But during the ministry we read about in the gospels, all these people who don't qualify are loved by him, welcomed by him, and they are attracted to him like, what's the old cliche, like like flies to sugar or bees to honey or whatever. But uh, I'm mixing my metaphors here. But, but they're attracted to him, and they're not put off by him. And so he can sit, in John 3, he sits with Nicodemus, who's a member of the, the Jewish ruling council, the Sanhedrin. And he can talk to him, even though Nicodemus sneaks in there at night, because he he doesn't want to be known that he doesn't want known that he's talking with Jesus. But even though he does that, um, Jesus welcomes and he talks with them. But he also will talk with a woman caught in adultery in mercy and kindness. Or he'll call Matthew, who's a tax collector hated by most Jews, to be one of his twelve. And and so he had this ability to be truthful and honest and speak the truth, but do so in love. And maybe the woman at the well is the best example of that from John four where uh, Jesus is talking with the Samaritan woman. She's there in the middle of the day, probably because she felt uncomfortable going with the other ladies in the morning or in the evening. And we find out why, right? Jesus says, go call your husband. And she says, well, I'm, I'm not married. And he says, you know, you're right. You've had five husbands, and the guy you're living with now is not your husband. So she was shacking up with a guy in the present and had been married, and I'm assuming divorced, five times. Now, how would we look at someone like that? Typically, if we're a good Christian, we, we would say, oh, yeah, you, you don't belong. Lost cause. Lost cause, yeah. And, and yet, for Jesus, she's not a lost cause. And in fact, he turns around, brings her to faith, and she ends up becoming a great missionary. And so Jesus treated that woman, sinful as she was, and she was, um, with great mercy. And he treated her as a, as a child, a daughter of God. And that's the challenge for us when we love our neighbors, that we don't want to see that person as a daughter or son of God created in his image, one for whom Christ died. It's, it's much easier, and our sinful nature just runs right there to, to, to push them to the side, to dehumanize, as you, as you say. And, 
And that's, that's damaging to our witnesses, damaging to the church, uh, when it comes to the church as well. So you had an illustration, I know we talked before about, we wanted to, to move away from the us versus them approach, because mm -hmm. that's easy, easy to do. And you had an illustration from a TV show, I believe. Yeah, and um, real quickly, before we get there, just looping back to what you were saying about Jesus and the woman at the well, as you were talking, it, it struck me. John says, in the same gospel, in John 1, 14, that Jesus came in, in grace and truth. Yeah. Right, and so a lot of this is really balancing out both of those things. We don't have to compromise on either of those no. as Christians, and and we can't. Um, and yeah. people need to hear the law. Yes, but but they don't need our self righteousness, and there's a difference. Yeah. Uh, with, with the woman caught in adultery, where after Jesus say, basically saves her life, he says, "Go and sin no more." So Jesus is not saying it's okay to sin sexually. It's okay to lie. It's okay to be deceitful. It's okay to let your anger rule your family and damage your family. He's not saying it's okay. None of that's okay. He died for that sin. That's how not okay it is. Yeah. But he is saying, uh, when I preach the law to you, I'm going to also preach mercy. And that's, I think, where much of the modern church fails. Um, it probably has always been that way. But, but we're, we're often quick to say, the Bible says, and here's what's true. And we need that. That's good. But we, we dare not forget to balance that with the message of mercy in Christ. Absolutely, absolutely. And I, I think part of the reason we're starting off with loving our neighbor in this podcast is because we could focus on why society has gone off the rails in so many different ways and mm -hmm. analyzing and discussing post-modernity and you know, all of the different societal and cultural factors and philosophies and all of these things. And maybe we'll do some of that. At some I'm sure point. we will, yeah. Um, but at the same time, um, if we're not loving our neighbors, right? Paul says, if you speak in the tongues of men and angels, but you have not love, yeah. then you are a clanging gong, right? Yeah. You're a noisemaker. Yeah, a noisemaker, and that's it. And so we have to hold out both grace and truth there, because if we, and, and imitate Jesus in that way, because if we don't, then we might win an argument and end up losing the, the war, so yeah. to speak. And, yeah. and that gets to uh, that television illustration that we were talking about there uh, from the show Survivor. And I don't know if any of you ever watched Survivor <laughs> as a kid. And I don't even know if they're still going. They had like 25 are. seasons at least, probably. Uh, but I remember watching as a kid, and there was one particular guy that was pretty memorable named uh, Russell Hans, I think is how you pronounced his name and he's like one of the greatest survivor villains of all time because he went in and um, he just dominated the game and if you don't know the premise of survivor you have people on an island and they're trying to be the last one standing they vote each other off um, so there's a lot of strategy and alliances and some backstabbing but he got everybody to believe that they were on his side that uh, he had an alliance with them and they were going to backstab the other person, but not them. And he, he went and he did this and backstabbed everybody all the way up to the finale. And then at the finale, the people that have been voted off have to vote between the last two people who wins the competition. And he did this two seasons in a row, which makes it even more impressive. People still believed him the second season. But both times, the jury voted for the other person because they were so hurt by the way he had damaged them in their relationships. And so you could say that he had dominated this game, right? That he had won the arguments, that he had um, won the competition, but he had totally missed the larger point of the game. He lost the war, so to speak, um, because he had just destroyed these relationships. Yeah, And I think that's really a good illustration for us today that we can um, we can win right we can tell the truth right we can drop the hammer on people in our in different conversations and arguments but if we don't love people if our conversations aren't advancing relationships mm -hmm. and making openings for us to actually proclaim Christ um, in those relationships uh, then we're we're losing yeah. even if we win yeah, that's it's such a good illustration. And some of what you and I talked about before dealt with that. And you, you had a, 
a, a phrase I really liked when we were started kind of thinking about what we would say today. You said we should be like Jesus and that we're almost unoffendable. Mm. And that, that when people attack us personally, we should be the bigger people. We can recognize that people without Christ, we can't expect them to act like the Holy Spirit's at work in their lives. And, and that when they attack us personally, that's, that can be painful, but that's not really the issue. It really isn't the issue. The issue is that person needs Christ. And, and so if they're going to attack me and, and tell me I'm stupid, tell me I have the wrong idea, tell me I've, I'm foolish for following God, I, I'm not scientific or I'm not intelligent or whatever, you know, they can say that, but they don't know what they're talking about. They, they don't have a worldview based in Christ and his love for the world that he created. And, and that they're warped in their vision. They need glasses. Right, and and so for us to recognize it and to love them in their 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 sin and and brokenness because they need help that makes all the difference. And, and then all of a sudden we're not these righteous Christians with you know slogans on our pickups and and web pages that proclaim the the truth that you deserve to go to hell and you're you're on your way now. Yeah, you know that may be true. But that's not the best way to preach that. At least Jesus didn't do it. And I think we should go with Jesus. Well, absolutely. Um, you, you can never go wrong there. And if we really believe in original sin, too, right, that we are spiritually blind, we are spiritually yes. dead in our sins, um, well, then those people are just doing what sinful people do. They did, they're doing what we did before God um, before God saved us right. and brought us to faith. Yep. And any sinner would do that. Yep. And so, you know, how can you not have compassion on them? How can you not love them that way? Yeah, I, I was just looking in the book of Titus, and I'll get this wrong a little bit, but you all folks at home can check me and read your Bible. It's in Titus chapter 3. And Paul, uh, I don't want, I want to say maybe around verse 2 or 3, he says something to the effect of, at one time we too were uh, disobedient and foolish, uh, enslaved, and all kinds of passions and pleasures, but then God showed up. And in, in our baptism, he, he wiped us clean of our sins. He saved us, not through good things we did, but because of his mercy. And he poured out on us the Holy Spirit uh, so that we might become heirs, having the hope of eternal life. So when he did that, that changes, that gives us glasses. It gives us a new worldview. But but I love that, that section of verses because it reminds us, this is where we all were. We all were by nature objects of God's wrath, you know, Ephesians 2. And because of that, how can I then look, look behind me at someone who just hasn't made it yet and despise and hate them? Because that's where I was when I was yeah. conceived. Uh, and so to, to remember that it helps us to have compassion for people who aren't there yet. And then our, our, our prayer then, well, and, and we, you, you said this thing the other day as well, that, that, that people are not the enemy, they are the mission. People are not the enemy, they are the mission. And our real enemy, as Paul writes in Ephesians 6, is uh, not, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Satan is our enemy. And he wants to capture these people uh, and drag them into hell because... In a certain way, it's the only way he can get back at Jesus now. Jesus has defeated him. And he can hurt God by, by hurting us and, and taking people to hell. And we, we don't want that. And so, again, that makes people the mission, not the enemy. Amen. Amen. And you had a, a really good way of kind of responding to this the other day when you said, okay, so if uh, kind of dropping the hammer of truth on people isn't a, isn't a win, then what is a win? Um, yeah. what, what are our criteria then for, um, for talking with people? What, what can we count as a successful conversation there? Which I thought was a really good way to advance the conversation and our way of thinking about how we treat our neighbor. Yeah, exactly. So have I listened well? If I'm talking with someone like you, if you were to be an unbeliever who's maybe a little hostile or maybe not, it doesn't really matter. But am I listening well? Am I understanding where they're coming from? Because it's so easy to have in my mind the answer. Here's the answer, stupid. <laughs> let, let me tell you where you're wrong and fix you. And, and they don't need adjustments to their philosophy first. That'll come. 
They need Christ. And so if I listen well, then I can, I can hear the frustration about maybe they take a very different view than I do about politics or sexuality or money or government or whatever it is. But if I listen well, I can understand them. And, and, and maybe they have a fear. Um, I, I, I remember, I can say this about my dad because he's with the Lord now, but I remember finding out my dad um, had been a registered Democrat all his life. I mean, horror of horrors, right? <laughs> And, and it was hard for me to understand because I'm, I'm very pro-life, and so I, I move towards political groups that are pro-life. Um, but then he said, you know, son, when I was young, that was a long time ago, he said, to me it seemed like the Democrats thought about the little guy, and the Republicans didn't. In other words, the, the, the family that's not a big business, they don't have anything. He said, that, that's how I saw that, and to me that was important. And that's important to Jesus. Jesus cares about the little guy. Uh, the, the single mom, uh, the family that's near the poverty level, uh, the recent immigrants who struggle with English, um, the high school kid who graduates and says, I, I don't know what I want to do. Jesus cares about all those people. And so if I listen well to someone and I, and I hear that that's where they're coming from, and I'm not all focused on my particular political view or what I think is right, then all of a sudden I'm far more easily able to bring the gospel to bear. Mm -hmm. To say, you know... I may not be an expert in politics, but here's one thing I know. Is that Jesus cares about you and your family. And that's what they need to hear. Yeah. We can deal with politics later, but, but they need Jesus Christ. And that's a win when we listen well. And, and there are some other things I had here. Um, do I see that person as loved by God? Mm -hmm. uh, Max Lucado, uh, he's a pastor, been around a long time, and he wrote a number of kind of devotional books years ago. And he, he tells a true story. He was a missionary in Brazil. And he knew two brothers, and uh, they saved up a ton of money, in, in the equivalent of like $100,000 U.S., and uh, they were going to open a gym. Well, one of the guys was like this big-time bodybuilder, super strong, and the other guy was kind of going to be the money guy and the manager and all that. And so they saved up all this money, and they, they, they had uh, negotiated a contract to either buy or lease a building. And so the, the bodybuilder guy, you know, the strong guy, he went down to the bank and said, hey, we need to make a, our first payment. I'm so excited. And the guy says, well, I'm, I'm sorry, Bill. There's no money in the account. His brother had come the day before and cleaned out the entire account. And he swore then, I get my hands around his scrawny little neck. I'm going to kill him. And, and uh, his brother couldn't locate him, wouldn't answer his phone. He disappeared. Well, he found him quite a few months later at a marketplace. And he was walking into the marketplace, and there was his brother. His brother didn't see him. And his initial thought was, I'm just going to kill him. I, I don't care if I go to jail. But then when, when he walked towards him, his brother turned around and, and faced him. Uh, the brother says, I looked in his face and I saw my dad's face. I couldn't kill him. And, and what a beautiful illustration that is for when we see human beings, they're created in the image of God. And, and so a win is, do I, do I look at this person despite they might be spewing vitriol at me, but do I look at them and say, that person's a child of God. I, I, can, I can see a faint reflection of my father's image there. That makes all the difference. And, and I think that requires then, you know, prayer and all kinds of things. And kind of as we move now towards where we want to end up with this, the, the honest admission I think we have to make and repent of is, I don't love my neighbor. I cannot do this on my own. I, I need supernatural strength. I need a strength that is, that is beyond uh, what I have. And, and that's where we get then into the context of the question. So when Jesus is asked, what's, what's the goat? What's the greatest commandment of all time? And he answers. And he brings up the second one, love your neighbor as yourself. He's actually asked this question in the week before his death. And uh, as Pastor Kyle and I talked about this, you know, it was just really, really fascinating to think about that. Because what is Jesus about to do? He's going to love God with all his heart, soul, strength, and mind. He's going to go to the Garden of Gethsemane on, late on Thursday night. He's going to say, Father, if possible, let this cup pass from me. He's going to say, I, I, in effect, I don't want to do this because I know how agonizing it's going to be. But then he says, not my will, yours be done. So he's going to love the Father. He's going to follow the plan, the plan of salvation that God had set in in effect, really before the beginning of time. And he's going to allow himself to be arrested. 
He will stand before the Jewish council. He will stand before Pilate. He will be led out to a cross after being flogged. He will hang there on a cross. And, and he will do what his father asks. He will love his, the Lord his God with all his heart, with all his soul, with all his strength. He'll spend his last strength and die with all his mind, being faithful to that, which is incredible. But just as incredible, at the same time, he will be loving his neighbor as himself. Jesus will take upon himself the sin of us lo not loving our neighbors. The, you know, the, the hatred and violence we saw back in, uh, in here in January and this summer, you know, the looting and the violence and the racism and the hatred. On the cross, Jesus took the punishment for that upon himself. And, 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 and the, the lack of love we have for our, the people, the neighbors in our own lives. The people we, we think are idiots. The people who disagree with us about how we should handle COVID or the people who are of a different political party. And, and we, we hate them at times. And on the cross, Jesus dies for that. He's loving his neighbor, he's loving us. And, and of, of the Jewish leadership that's by the cross, reviling him, mocking him. Yeah, come down from the cross, can't do it now, can you? And he says, Father, forgive them. He's loving his neighbor. All the way to the end. He dies for even those, those idiots who put him on a cross. Because they were made in the image of God. And Jesus said, yeah, I love them. I love even them. And, and what powerful grace there is there for us who have not loved our neighbors. Jesus says to me and to you and to all of us, he says, I love even you. And maybe we haven't smashed in windows and maybe we haven't, stormed buildings, and maybe we haven't killed anybody. But the Bible teaches that not loving your neighbor is like being a murderer. And Jesus loves even us. He loves us. He considers us our neighbors. And that makes us neighbors. Amen. Yeah. And so, again, when, when we're in church, uh, whether it's outdoors or even online, we are brought together then as parts of the body of Christ. And so we look across each other uh, at the communion rail whenever we get able to do that again. And, and we're baptized, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. And, and we're brought into the body of Christ. And that's where we find the supernatural strength that we need. Uh, when we are washed of our sins and made strong, um, buried with him through baptism into death, in order that we may live a new life. Just like Christ was raised from the dead, we may live a new life. That's the power to love your neighbor, to, to, to receive the Lord's Supper. This is my body, Jesus says. This is my blood shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. That's where we receive supernatural strength. When we open our Bibles and read, not just the truth, but as you said, the grace that God could love a wretch like me, that's then where our heart is changed. And God takes out this heart of stone and he puts in a heart of flesh and he makes us different people absolutely the absolutely. people we're always meant to be. and there's there's such security in that too mm -hmm. in knowing god's grace um and that he has proclaimed this definite sure and certain word of forgiveness for me and for you even despite our sins and that nothing uh, the world out there does can tear down God's kingdom, right? Mm -hmm. um, the gates of hell cannot overcome God's church, Jesus says, and he is always with us. And so there's security in that. That's As right. the baptized and forgiven, washed, sanctified children of God, um, and he, he's placed his spirit on us as his seal, his guarantee of salvation. And so we don't have to be threatened. Um, as we said earlier, we don't have to be threatened. We don't have to be offended by all these people. We can be free just to love them, mm -hmm. just to love them. Yeah. Um, and to, to ask ourselves, okay now, so our salvation is secure. God's kingdom is secure. The world isn't gonna tear it down. It doesn't have the weapons to do that. Jesus has already won the victory. So what does a win look like in these, um, these smaller conversations and interactions as we go about treating our, our neighbor as a mission and not an enemy. Um, yeah. Returning to these questions, do I know them better after this conversation is over? Mm -hmm. 
do I know, even if I disagree with them, is there maybe an impulse behind their, um, what they're saying or their position that I can admire a little bit, you know, maybe caring for the poor, even if I don't agree with how they want to go about that in their political positions. That's not a bad thing. Um, so do I, uh, can I open up a door to talk with them later so that it's just not a one-off conversation? Yeah. Um, and all of these sorts of different things. Is the relationship growing? Is God's name hallowed, um, made holy in this conversation uh, by way of my conduct? And so reframing how we view uh, our wins and our losses um, right in light of the mm-hmm. greatest of all time, the greatest commandment of all time. And the greatest um, person of all time, right? Yeah. He's the real goat. Yes. Jesus is, you know. Yeah. Uh, Brady pales in comparison. Yeah. You know, Jesus is the guy who actually won all the important victories. Yeah. He defeated our sin when he died for it. He defeated death when he rose from the grave. And Satan has no weapons left except lies and fear. Yeah. He, he cannot take our salvation, as you said. And so... So that means we can spend ourselves. We, as you said, so well, we operate from a place of security. You know, when you feel really secure and confident, um, you, you'll you'll be comfortable and relaxed in doing what you do, whether that's at work or, uh, like, uh, when we had our first baby, uh, Abigail came home and we looked at it. It was like, well, what do I do now? But when the second one rolls around, then it's like, okay, I got this. I, I know what the, I know jaundice isn't life threatening. You know. Uh, fevers go higher for kids than they do for adults. I know this. I'm, I'm okay. I'm, I'm operating from a place of security. And we have the greatest security of all. Christ has us. We're forgiven. Heaven, uh, the new heaven and the new earth are our ultimate destination. Nobody can take that away from us. So I, I, I don't have to operate from a place of insecurity in, in my conversations with other people. I can just love them. I can spend myself as Jesus spent himself, knowing that he's invested so much in me, I'll never run out. And what a great place that is to operate from. So we want to thank you guys for joining us today. Um, even now in my mind, I, I've got like five different ways to go with this conversation for next time. We'll keep uh, tweaking um, the technology as we go through this, but thank you for being a part of this. If you have questions or um, comments, we'll, uh, in the video description, we'll put our email addresses in there, You can, or maybe just the church website, and then you can see all the stuff, including our uh, contact staff links. Um, because this is a, intended to be light conversations. We're talking about the light of Christ that it brings to us. So as we close today, uh, we pray that in some small way this may have been beneficial for you. We're going to close in prayer and ask you to pray with us. Jesus Christ, you are the greatest of all time. You are the light of the world. And yet in, in humility, you offered yourself as a sacrifice for our sin in obedience and love for your Father and in love for us, your neighbors. Shape us and mold us to be like you. Help us to rejoice in in the great power of your resurrection in our lives so that we can love others just like you love us. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thanks. We'll see you next time. The Lord be with you. And also with you.